Hello and welcome to the NBA Show Reviews. I am your host, Norman Sanzo. Joining me today is Silver Quill. I'm ready for my close-up, Mr. Sanzo. All right, then. And also joining us is James Cork. Hello, everybody. I'm James Cork. And I'm here to tell you about the most disappointing movie I've ever seen since Star Wars Episode 7, The Force Awakens. Oh, wow. <laughs> I'm not going to make that voice for the rest of the video. Don't worry about it. <laughs> I have to start with my Mr. Blinkett. Come on. <laughs> so, anywho, in today's review show, we are going to review the My Little Pony movie. So, in this one, at their home dream castle, the ponies are running and playing through flower meadows and grass green fields with their animal friends. Elsewhere, baby... What? What? I'm, I'm reading a snobbies here. Elsewhere, baby, uh. like it be split, is practicing her new dance step. As Spike, a baby dragon, accompanies her rehearsal on the piano. Meanwhile... Um, I- Silver, I think that the mention has finally hit Norman. What? It finally happened. I broke him. Wait, 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 yeah. wait, wait, wait. You have... Am I saying I'm, am I saying something wrong here? Because I'm I'm reading the synopsis here. If your synopsis includes an attack by the smooths, we 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 have to talk. Uh, yeah, smooth, we, need smooth, to, smooth. we need to talk, Norman. Oh yeah, okay. Uh, before the smooths. Oh wait, uh, I, I don't remember seeing the smooths. They say rainbow. Uh, yeah, yeah. So and also Megan. Uh, you, uh, I don't remember seeing Megan. And the box office for this one is six million. There's something not right. And release date June twentieth, nineteen eighty. Oh, oh! I, I see my mistake. Yes, <clears throat> yes. Uh, no. Okay. Ah, the two thousand seventeen film. Now that makes a lot of sense. So, anywho, the ponies are the NBA show where the, the NBA show where the comedy starts to resemble Family Guy. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my god. Uh, but anywho, on a serious note, yes, we're going to review the two thousand seventeen. Serious note. What kind of show are you doing here if you are on a serious note <laughs> i don't know but anywho uh getting back on track uh 2017 movie yes we're gonna review that one so uh probably the 1986 movie will have to wait some other day uh, <clears throat> but anywho for this one what can we say we all watched it in theaters we all had a lot of fun and this movie was quote-unquote awesome so, uh, time to be awesome. Yes, speak for yourself. So, you know, I think it be, I think it will be a good idea to go uh, to go around the board and gather uh, scores. I have been using scores lately because they make things a lot sim- a lot more simple, and then we can ex- expand about on what we think works and doesn't. So, I think it will be a good idea to start saying what what score we will give to the movie. Uh, from 1 to 10, 1 being the lowest and 10 being the highest, without high, ha- going into uh, something point whatever. J- just let, give solid scores. What do you guys think? So let's see. Uh, since you suggested it, I'll go first then. Uh, personally for me, I'll give it an 8. And this is the biasness talking. If I was not biased, I'll give it a 7. Wow, 8 out of 10. Yep. yep. Well, all right. That's That's a very high. Silver, what about you? Mm, mm, mm. See, normally I don't like uh, giving scores because of SF Debris' tagline, all scores are relative to their series, which then the score loses some meaning, I think. But I would probably mark it at 7 out of 10. I'd be a little bit sterner, but still enjoyed it. I am more on your on your side of the of the board, Silver. I, I actually thought I was going to give it two different, two different opinions. Uh, because me being the movie buff, there is no other reason why I'm here. I'm the movie guy. We're talking about the movie. I need to be here, all right? And I thought it was going to give it a movie buff score and a brony score. As in, like, okay, as a fan of the show, the movie is this, but movie-wise, it's not so much. No, it turns out that both sides are actually very pleased. Both my movie buff side and my my fan of My Little Pony side. So uh, I also will give it a... A 7 out of 10, but it's a very solid uh, 7 out of 10. Hmm, alright. So I'm the only one here who gives it an 8. That's because I'm a fan. As a movie to itself, a 7. So I think we're on the same page. Roundabout. Mm-hmm. Something like that. Yeah, you could say that. 
So, what works for this movie? Like, okay, here's the thing. We can go for the whole, let's go by scene by scenes. We just go for the characters and whatnot, but you know what? We're going to be here until tomorrow <laughs> yeah. if we do that, yeah. man. But here's the thing. We all know the characters already. We already mentioned the added new characters, except for Queen Novo, Princess Sky Star, and a few. But they're... Gruber. Yeah, Gruber. We didn't talk about Gruber on the, on the comics. Who cares about yeah, Gruber? Yeah, anyway. whatever. But still, yeah. <laughs> but still, let's go for overall thoughts. Like, since this is a movie, what was your experience like? Silver, since it came out early for you, what was your experience like, man? Well, I went the Thursday before its official release date. You know, movies are now getting released earlier and earlier. So basically October 5th then, on a midnight to 9, something like that? You got the yeah. preview. You got the, what's basically the preview of the movie. Well, I went to my favorite theater, the Alamo Draft House, and to my great surprise, the only other attendees were my friend, a grandmother-and her little granddaughter, and a couple in their mid-20s. Really? That was it. That oh. was it at first. Oh, at first. Okay. The theater didn't fill up more. It was just us, and it was a small theater. And the Alamo, near where I live, is geared more towards adult demographic. Okay, okay. So in some ways, I was a little bit com more comfortable that way. I thought, I, I empathize with parents if they're wary of grown men being in the theater with their children. Yeah, no kidding. That's understandable. All right, all right. In any way. Been in and I watched it and I I got swept up in the the spectacle. I played Spot the Pony yeah, yeah. with all the background characters. Yeah. Uh, had a lot of fun and it, it it is above all this movie is fun. I will say that you you start to witness the tightrope that the that the sh the movie is trying to walk. Too much continuity and you become impenetrable to the casual viewer. Too little and you risk losing some fans. Yep, indeed, indeed. I understand that fact. And as a casual movie guy who just goes into theaters just to sleep in it, I can see your point. And if you've got no idea who those ponies are, you'll be lost. Good thing I'm a fan. Yay. So what about you, James? How did you experience your movie like? I managed to catch a viewing of the movie on Glasgow when I went to Scott. The Friday before the convention, right when they were about to get the movie out of the theater, I thought I was never going to be able to watch it. Because the, the movie just premiered yesterday. No, Friday. Last Friday in Spain. And not only that, but it got dubbed into Spanish. And the Spanish dub of the My Little Pony show and the movie, they are, they are terrible. Really? Th they really are. And from what the reviews have been saying, they also dubbed all the songs in the movie. And they did a botched work with it. Um, so I, I said, I want to watch the movie in English. I want to watch it in the original version. I want to watch the original dub. I'm going to either wait until it comes out over here in Spain, hopefully in English, or I'm going to wait until I watch it in, uh, uh, before I go to Bronny Scott in Scotland. Uh, thankfully I did. And the theater was a uh, halfway full. Wow. And it was all grown-up boys, grown-up guys. Timing, because you said Bronny Scott, so it was the timing... It was all bronies. It was all bronies. Uh, it was just bronies in my theater. And f you know what? It was the most well-behaved, quiet, and respectful audience I have seen a movie with. Uh, there was no shouting, no screaming. I was expecting uncomfortable or awkward moments, like whenever one of the new characters showed up or whenever one of the main six will show up. I honestly was expecting one of them to show up at Akimakura. <laughs> I was expecting a body pillow to appear at any point. But no, no none of that. They were great. Uh so yeah, the experience of watching the movie in the theater was nice. Uh it was it was really good. It definitely scratched an itch that I had ever since they announced the movie and I was like, Well, I'm stuck in Podunk City, not able to watch a movie properly because the theaters around this area suck. So well, as for me well, uh my mine's an interesting story. Not to the extent of how yours was, James, but uh, the theaters in my area are okay. They're feasible. And for the My Little Pony movie, the my favorite theater did not bring it in. For whatever reason, I can tell it's because of marketing. They didn't want it because they know they couldn't sell. So they didn't brought it in. Another theater did. But I'm not willing to go and be the only guy there and whatnot. So one of my... Brony groups on the Facebooks had a meetup. And I said, I'll be going. And here's the thing. I live near the south from where everybody is. 
And to make that trip, it's a 300 kilometer plus travel. So just imagine uh, 300 kilometers to miles. I got no idea. You do the calculation at home. So I had to take a 300, well, let's say 600 kilometer trip back and forth. So I did. And I did not want to drive. So I took the plane. So I took the plane, I stayed at a hotel, I watched the movie, it was awesome. Had meet everyone there, had a good time. And for people who got no idea, you guys spent, well probably James, you spent a bit on the movie experience because of your travels, probably same like me. I do have an excuse in that I was going oh, to yeah, Brownie Scott. Yeah. So it was it was planned to me. It was, oh, now that I am at Brownie Scott before the convention, I'm, I'm going to go see the movie. And I took my friends with me, so I didn't go see it alone. I took uh, Mecca and Corner to go see the movie so with me. It's an added bonus so, then. So, uh, Silver, you watched it in theaters locally to you, so you're pretty close. I had to... T- uh, let's just say my movie experience cost more than $100. <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't get anything fancy like a drink mug or a popcorn bucket or anything like that. All I had was stickers. <laughs> you, you you are the only person that I know that will figure out a way to complain about stickers. It's, you adhere to certain standards. <laughs> you yeah. have to remember, I spent more than $100 to watch the movie. <clears throat> So anywho, yes, movie experience was fun. Uh, brony group was there. Uh, there was a lot of bronies in there. There were uh, parents and their kids. And I saw this one cute child with her parents <laughs> carrying her pony toy, watching the movie, and she was enjoying it. That made it for me. Like, yes, this is what Hasbro wants, to have kids watch the movie. Yes, and I'm just in there for the ride. And I enjoyed it much. Really, really much. Uh, experience watching movie was fun. So, now, what's next on the list? Uh, I actually would like to tackle the uh, the cold hard facts regarding the movie, actually. The cold hard facts of yeah. evilness. <laughs> it's, uh, it's something that I was talking to you guys about before, the, uh, before we started recording. How the, the fandom figures out Every every few months or so, definitely every six months, figure something out that is going to kill the fandom and it's going to destroy My Little Pony forever. Uh, every six months, I feel like that's every week. <laughs> it was uh, how much? Uh, how many months were between Twilight getting wings to them turning into humans? Oh, that was at least six months. Yeah, I, that's that's why I say, and then Twilight getting the castle, and then Twilight getting Starlight Glimmer as an apprentice, and it's every single few weeks that is something that is gonna kill the fandom, and the movie was one of those. Uh, so I I I would like to t- kind of with your gu- with your guys' help dispel all of those fears. The, during the first few weeks of the movie being out in theaters, I was checking box office mojo on a website called The Numbers. To check the box office uh, uh, predictions for the My Little Pony movie, and one trend that I noticed, and I don't know if you guys have noticed that this year everything has underperformed. Uh, they said that Blade Runner 2049 was going to open to 60 or or 70 million dollars. It didn't even make 50. Uh, they said that that uh, Justice League was going to make over 100 million. It didn't even make 90. Uh, the My Little Pony movie, it was predicted to make between 20 and, 20, 10 and 15 million dollars. It ended up making like 8.8. But the fact that it made 8.8 million, that there was enough of, of an audience to make 8.8 million dollars based on this movie is insane. The, the fact that as the, at the time that we are recording this, it's still playing in theaters, it's insane. It made over 51 million dollars worldwide. That is a lot of money. That is more money than any of us is going to see in our lifetime. And uh, th- there was there was some papers being shared about on, on 4chan. And, okay, this is all alleged from now on, okay? They were sharing what is supposed to be the budget for the movie. And there was a ton of information regarding that. There is no way that can be fake with the amount of... Uh, data and numbers and budget splits that they were making on those papers. And according to that, the net worth budget of the movie, uh, which translates to the break-even point of the film, 
the break-even point of the My Little Pony movie was $25 million. If you make a movie for $25 million, that it includes production and promotion, and you make $51 million out of it, you made the budget back, and you made a profit that is equal or a little bit bigger than the budget of the film. Hasbro is looking at that, and they're thinking, huh, this movie that costed us this much, we made enough to make another two movies like that. They are looking at that, and they're, they're thinking, that we're going to make more movies. There goes season 8 and season 9. We're doing <laughs> it. That's the way that I see it, in that we shouldn't get angry, we shouldn't get freaked out, we shouldn't... We shouldn't go, oh, the movie costed $65 million and it's not making its money back. The movie tanked. Guys, even if the movie tanked, it's the DVD sales and the Blu-ray sales that tend to save these kinds of movies. And the toy sales as well. And we haven't even gotten to those. Because none of those things are out by the time that we are recording this. So who knows how much more money has this movie left to do. And... You may be thinking, oh, James, you're just focusing on the money aspect of this. Well, guess what, guys? This TV show, this movie, is all focused on that. You are watching a big commercial. It's easy to forget that you're watching a big commercial because of the likable characters, the beautiful animation, how well written it is. And I'm including both the TV show and the movie on this, not just the movie. It's easy to forget that you're watching a commercial because you're so involved into it. But in the end, you're just watching a commercial. So I say, people, don't freak out. Calm down. Don't run around like a headless chicken. We have silver pool for that. Um, <laughs> uh, don't, don't, don't freak out. Just take it easy. Way worse bombs have uh, been uh, dealt with that have given us other things in, in in the past, okay? So, d don't worry. It's it's a movie. Take it like a movie. Don't don't worry. Okay, that's that's the end of my tirade. Yeah, it's cool, it's cool. I mean, if people are looking into the budget of a movie, they're looking at it so wrong because you as fan are not supposed to look at the budget. You as fans are supposed to look at the content. The budget is for the yeah. Hasbro guys to think and worry about because we as fans are just eating content. Like, if they give us a movie, we take it. Like, for now, I, I highly enjoy the movie. I'm going to buy the DVD. And if there's the, whatchamacallit, uh, digital copy, I'm going to try and get it. So, yeah, Hasbro will get money there. They took my, quote-unquote, ten dollars for the movie ticket and they're gonna take my ten dollars for the dvds so yay they win so anywho let's get into the meat of the movie which is characters let's go for characters then because we mentioned some of them in the prequel comics so let's talk about them here now as they're presented in full in the movies so who do you want to start off first should we go for the main six or the newest addition to the movies I think it would be a good idea to start with the main six. I, what do you think, Silver? I think we should start with the breakout character of the movie. Oh, Robert. yeah, man! Woo! <laughs> oh, man, could you just imagine the porcupine? Oh, man. No, oh, is it a hedgehog? I forgot. But still. <laughs> he's, a, he's, a, he's a honey badger. He used to appear on The Lion Guard before they cast him yeah, in the movie. Oh, man, he, he's voiced by Michael Penna. And, oh, I remember the behind-the-scenes thing that uh, Megan mentioned. If you have Michael Penna, you let him say whatever he wants. Yeah, man. Like, whoo, that's awesome. And <laughs> mm. uh, I can't pretend anymore. He sucks. Oh, come on. That's been too... That's, that's not really been fair. He's not the best character in the movie, but he just serves a purpose. Okay, here's the thing. If he was not voiced by a great comedian like Michael Penna, I would have accepted it. But the problem is, it's Michael Penna. I, and we seen... I wouldn't I wouldn't even call Michael Penna that good of a comedian. still, he proven actually. his point what he could do in movies. Remember uh, Ant-Man? He played that? No, dude, dude. I, I, I've been following Michael Penna since I first saw him in Crash. And in Crash, he's a he's a better dramatic actor than he's a comedian. He was great in Crash. He was great in The Martian. He was fantastic in Fury. Uh, he's a very good dramatic actor. I don't think he's that good of a comedian, still, though. Like, I remember that scene in Ant-Man. That scene sold me to his character. And I, I don't know. I feel that it's wasted potential. Like, he could have done better. But nah, potential wasted. 
So to to me, if you want to talk about wasted potential, should we talk about the Storm King, also known as Mr. Not Appearing in this movie? Before that, before we hit to him, let <laughs> before we hit to him, <laughs> let, let's have a roundtable discussion. No, let's have a roundtable view of Grubber because I sit my view. What about you, James? What about you? I already said what I think of Grubber. I think he's he just serves a purpose. He is the the comedic foil. He's the guy that is that is trying to ease the situation whenever Tempest is going way to Edge of Tomorrow. It's not a character that I will say is great or depthful or anything like that. He's just there. He doesn't right. bother me. But I can totally see why uh, why you guys would get bothered by him. What about you, Silver? Well, that's just it. He's there, but he's not really doing anything. Uh, I guess his really most defining scene is when Tempest charges him with getting the ponies. They fall over a waterfall. And he's like, oh, you guys go down and get him. I don't want to. And I was like, that was your role for this movie. You're the assistant and you're not even assisting. It's at that point that you realize he's just going to be there to giggle or say, oh, you got owned by Tempest. If anything, it's it's sort of like a, a wrestling manager. Like at least the wrestling manager does something. He pulls the leg off the contenders and that, you know what? Uh, okay. So he's there. I'm annoyed by him. Uh, so on. So yeah. Uh, next character, Storm King. Who? <laughs> well, Storm King, yeah, he's in it even less than Grubber, but at least he has yeah. a presence. Uh, his first introduction to the movie was, what? <laughs> I didn't know they had Apple there. They had Apple, they had a ringtone. It's like, is this thing on? You can never tell when it's <laughs> magic. You know, that reminded me of, and I don't think you should be thinking of uh, Roger Corman movies when you're watching My Little Pony, but that reminded me of Death Stalker 2. And, because it, it has one scene where a character has a, a, has a video call with another character via... Uh, magic basin and that's more or less how it happens in the movie uh. and I was like why am I thinking of Death Stalker while, watch while watching the My Little Pony movie uh, Death Stalker has is explicit let's just say that <laughs> <laughs> so to think about that movie when watching this colorful thing maybe wow the contrast the man <laughs> I it's it's well, that's one thing that the movie does. The atmosphere, the tone, and everything, it's very 80s. For better mm -hmm. or for worse, it's very 80s. And it has tropes that have been on on, on movies from that mm -hmm. time. The thing is that it's... That the first... Two, well, we're going to go into that later. Let's keep talking about the yeah, Storm yeah. King. Sorry, I get so, thrown on. I don't know. I, I think I'll go first then, because the Storm King here is mediocre. He He, he has the potential to be great, but... Uh, he he just doesn't show up much. Like I think total screen time would be around ten minutes. That's just me being uh, generous with the timing here. But uh, he's just there. Like wish he could be there more often. He he has a presence. Like he did his silly moments and whatnot. And uh, wasted potential with the actor here. Uh, so much wasted potential. I, I I don't know what to say. <laughs> they could have done something to reestablish the character. They they break the, they broke the rule the rule of threes. Um they established the Storm King, then we forget about him all the way until the end of the movie. They should have had a scene where the Storm King is talking with Tempest and he just keeps egging her and, and pressing her and and she goes even more manic than she does in the film. They didn't do that. And by the time that the Storm King shows up while intimidating, I really like the moment where he just appears on the on the frame of the window, and he's like, "What are you going to show everyone?" and and he just steps in. It's like, "Oh, that's actually pretty intimidating." Yep. I am not, however, because he just appeared again. It's like, "Oh God, this, right, this guy is in the movie." Huh. <laughs> You kind of forget yeah. about him. You, you totally forget about him, because, which is unfortunate because his art style is pretty menacing. The look, his everything, but no, 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 no. They decided to go for the funny man till the end with his whole spree about, hey, I have a magic wand, look what I can do. Tuesday, Wednesday, Friday, Thursday, ha, ah, ha, ah, ha, day, night, day, night. I should trademark that <laughs> sentence. I should maybe trademark yeah. that sentence. Oh, I'm tracking the Storm King is doing well with demographics and yeah. whatnot. <sighs> like, wasted potential. As a villain, 
I Where think is Sombra is much more menacing than him. Sombra is much more menacing than him, only by yeah, inaction. True that. Still, what do you think, man? It's a lurking day. Go, go on, Silver. We just keep talking. We we either take control of the conversation or we talk over you, man. I'm sorry. No, nah, it's all good. Like you say, the Storm King, he, I found it more interesting in the comics because he was more visible and proactive. And this one, his declaration, I don't like cute things, mm. is a little bit Saturday morning villain cartoon. He, he's bad for badness' sake. And he is fun when he's playing with the sun and the moon and the Goodness knows the calendar system <laughs> in Equestria is just going to have a fit. Oh, yeah. But you sort of realize this is a guy who had no – he has great physical power and prowess and digits, but he has no no power to make him rival uh, the princesses. He only gets that at the end when he claims the staff. And so in a way you sort of realize, hey, this guy really wasn't that powerful to begin with. If he didn't have that staff, I'm betting Twilight and Company could have taken him easy. Yeah, true that. Because he didn't earn the power directly. Someone got it for him. Heck, I think Tempest could have taken him down. In, in a sense, she did. She kind of so did, yeah. But I think that that's what undermines his menace. He's a threat because he has a large army, not because of any personal power. Yeah, and like I said, we still potential. I think Hawkmoth is much better than him. He he does have that, and let's not forget, he's evil, you see, because he's the bad guy, and he's so wait, evil. So does this mean he wants to put freaking lasers on sharks? No, he wants to make a question of radio. <laughs> <laughs> you know, in the, in the My Little Pony art book, there are sketches of the Storm King posing and doing Donald Trump. Yeah, I saw that one. I have it. Yeah, I I have I have the art book here with me. I'm gonna I'm gonna open it and start just flipping oh, through the pages as we're reviewing the movie. But yeah, that that one is in there. Uh, they were having fun. Too bad that they couldn't go. Actually, you know what? If you go into the the, the best stuff about mm-hmm. the Storm King is in this book because the yeah. original the original concept of the Storm King was closer to the the Balrog from Lord of the Rings. Oh yeah, that thing is terrifying. Oh like, yeah. Oh. Why couldn't he turn into that? Yeah. Aside from the the flame and the and the, the shadow, you add lightning to it. This is gonna give the kids nightmares. That is exactly what we yeah, should have gotten. But still, uh, we got a PG version yeah. of a safe thing. So we've mentioned the <laughs> it's 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 uh, 1980s <laughs> yeah. PG. I will so... say <laughs> this is this is a very borderline PG. Well, what was Robocop movie? rated as when he went into theaters originally? Oh my god, you're going too far. Robocop was rated R. Really? You cannot compare. I was thinking more like, com- yeah, compare it more to uh, uh, a movie like The Last yeah. Unicorn or The Black Cauldron, which were both yeah. rated G. Uh, oh, G. <laughs> yeah. And and The Last Unicorn had nudity oh in it. But, <laughs> and it still it was rated uh, G. We mentioned the Storm King. Let's go for one of the favorites, which is Tempest herself. Are we going to talk about Emily Blunt? Yes. <laughs> Come on, she had the best uh, song. I, I would debate yeah. you on that, Silver. She had the uh, best song, she had the best character design, the best backstory. <laughs> Are you sure the backstory? She's the she she's the fandom's new waifu, uh <laughs> Are you kidding? She's Twilight's new shit. Oh my god. The, I've read. the 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 thing with with the I was when I when we were watching that movie, the movie and that scene at the end. We're gonna spoil in the movie now. We're oh. gonna spoil the movie. I yeah, think it doesn't we matter. We already right? went all in. Yeah, like the, when when Twilight and Tempest are just standing next to each other, and Twilight is <laughs> looking at her, and the look she gives to her, it's like, yes, another one for the harem. <laughs> <laughs> Twilight and her one hundred girlfriends. No, and, and one boyfriend. Oh no. <laughs> It's like, uh, five centuries off to the side saying, I'm totally okay with this. I am so okay uh, with this. But, <laughs> so I was like, mm, Tempest, you look lovely sandwich next to Trixie and Starlight. Oh, uh, Ouch, my cheek hurts. <laughs> Ouch. Tem- Tempest, Tempest sandwich and, and Trixie and Starlight are oh, the bread. Oh, my cheek hurts, you guys. Couldn't you just oh, eat God. it up? Stop it, stop yeah. it, stop it, stop it. Oh, God, my cheek hurts. Never, 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 uh, never, never, but, never, never. It's a very, it's a very twisted oh, sandwich. No. But anywho, um, Tempest here, her character is pretty interesting. I, I like her role here. She doesn't take crap from anyone except the Storm King, and she portrays this sense of confidence that you don't see in other characters or other villains, which is really interesting. I do like it. 
Yeah, the, the the fact that they broke her horn and gave her a scar, but there is an explanation as to why she's like that, makes her unique. There is no other. Uh, it's very easy to point out and say, oh, Edgy Mac- Edgerton, uh, original character, do not steal, she's red and black and with a broken horn and a scar. Or what? DeviantArt designed this character, but think about that. How many other characters like her have we had in the show? Sombra. No, I mean with a... I mean, oh, with yes. a purposely ro- broken horn that was not b- been raised to be uh, an evil king or anything like that. That she's just a regular unicorn. Still, yeah, I do agree with you. I do she's... agree with you in, on that because Stempus here, if you take a, if you really take a look, see at the whole um, character design, just from a objective point of view, without thinking that this character is official, she has a broken horn. OC check. She's dark tone, check. She has a scar, check. And she has a very dark backstory, check. All the workings of a OC character that is really edgelordy. Rebo will be proud. <laughs> Rebo? Reaper. Rainbow. Ah, oh, Reaper. Ah, oh, God. Don't make Overwatch <laughs> references. You don't want to bring that fun. Oh, here. I do. I play the game. We have enough with the bronies. We don't want to deal with the overwatch. Oh, you started well. out with the <laughs> die, die, die. <laughs> but anyway, one more off my list. Do you do you want to know how how hilarious this how? is though? The Funko pop, the the Funko Pop mm-hmm. of Tempest is a hot topic oh, exclusive. Wow. Okay, <laughs> it is. <laughs> to add into edge learners, my new white <laughs> Oh God, but still. <clears throat> <laughs> Reaper pointing at the screen. That's my <laughs> pony. Oh boy! But still, but still. Uh, uh, can we just can we just talk about can we just talk about Emily okay. Blunt for a bit? Okay. And uh, uh, I'm 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 going to get all the tomatoes for this one, but I don't care. Am I the only one who thought that she sounded a little bit wooden throughout the uh, movie? I don't know. I mean, at the very beginning, I kind of felt that she was a bit wooden or tilted or kind of not in character yet but as time goes on i can see oh okay she's getting into character she's getting into character and then oh they changed her character now she has to adapt to it and being nice she's good at being nice i found her a uh, performance i didn't think it wouldn't i thought she was calm and confident and menacing so i thought she fit the role and uh norman i understand you want to debate this but open up your eyes was my favorite song and here's where I think this is why no one's dismissing her as an OC. You know that a lot of people, they come up with those dark and edgy, all the physical wounds, and then, oh, he has such a grim backstory. But they never really go into what that backstory was and how it affected them. Open up your eyes. It allowed us to walk with uh, Tempest through her past, not just to the moment where she lost her horn and got that scar, but what happened after and this is why I think her, her tragic story works better than even Starlight. She tried to fit in after it, and everyone pulled away from her. Everyone was sort of scared of this now dysfunctional unicorn. And that, that creates isolation. That creates sort of a resentment of pony culture. You give us just enough information to know how she views the world, funny enough, as, as the song is conveying, and you realize why she is the way she is. I think that works. I just thought she was very well presented and at the only uh, movie character that got a backstory. Yeah, because out of all, all, all of the other new characters that were introduced, she was the only one with one. I mean, if you wanted to know where the other characters came from, you will have to read the comic. For a casual viewer, Tempest is presented really well. She's given a lot of screen time. I know that they wanted to make the best out of the best, the best use out of the. Uh, let, let's let's be fair here. The biggest celebrity voice actor they got in the movie, because okay, f- fair enough. I I love Zoe Saldana. I love Liz Schreiber. I love uh, Michael Peña. I love I love all these guys. I think the best asset they had in the movie was Emily Blunt. She's the one that has been in the most movies. To go back to what I was saying before about her sounding wooden, whatnot. This was my first impression, but when I left the movie, I was talking about this with my friends, and they said. She's not wooden. She's the only one that is not cartoony. Oh. And that's actually a very good point. Every other voice actor they brought in the movie, they played with a, with a fun twist. They played zany, or they played bouncy, or they played for the laughs. 
uh, Emily Blunt is the only one that plays the character like she comes from a dark place. Like she's she's bringing to the movie what's the same thing that she brought to like Edge of Tomorrow or Sicario. So like you have a character that is very dark in a movie that in itself is very colorful. That's why perhaps I think it came off, came off as wooden at the beginning. Because as the movie as the movie goes forward, it it, it the, my, my perception of her changed. That's why I said at the beginning. She sounded that's a bit what wooden. I've been saying. Like I do agree with Silver's point where that song kind of uh, put a ribbon onto her character. Yes, I totally do agree on that. And maybe I'm being unfair by comparing her villain song to the Lion King's villain song. So maybe that's an unfair comparison. But still. Um, to me, that's what I saw. The song was good, but compared to other villain songs, there are the betters out there. I'm going to say it right now, um, damn be the consequences. I, I think Open Up Your Eyes is way better than any of the other villain songs we had coming from Disney movies in the past 30 years. Give or take, I'm, I'm not a huge Disney fan from what I remember. Yeah. It's difficult when you put it against songs like Hellfire or uh, Be Prepared, uh, oh, songs yeah. like that. But thinking about that, I never really engage with. The, I never engage with the villains. I never care for the villains. I don't really care for the villains in Disney movies. To me, they are just an obstacle. I did care for Tempest, and her villain song is not so much a villain song, but a, a song about a character that that's uh, tortured, that is uh, a wreck inside, and that's trying to gather what's left of uh, of what made her identity. To me, it's a more interesting song, it's a more in-depth, if that that song could work in itself as, a, as an animated short, because it tells you everything you need, even when there is no lyrics, you can get that information through the visuals. B- visual storytelling, that's everything you need, that's what the movie is all about, it's it's visuals with, with music, visuals with song, visuals with sound. You don't need Tempest to sit in front of Twilight's cage and tell her about about her uh, life and her childhood <laughs> and whatever. You get all of that. You get all of that in three minutes. Yeah, I think that works there. And yeah, Tempest here is fan favorite. Like you mentioned before, Silver, I highly agree with your point on uh, Emily Blunt's character here, Tempest. She's played straight. She's played as, uh, what you mentioned before? Um, wounded character? Hurt character? And that's that's the third time that you confused me with Silver, Norman. How do you keep doing uh, it? After years and years <laughs> with recording with Silver. I I, I heard Silver <laughs> groaning Did you? when I said... Uh, uh, no, no. I, I heard Silver groaning before when I mentioned the whole thing about the, the, uh-huh. the song being uh, better. What what did you have to say about that, Silver? Mm-hmm. I, well, one, I'm thinking of the past 30 years. That is a huge swath mm-hmm. to cover. Well, oh, I, I must comb through. I mean, there have been some poor, unfortunate souls. That's probably one of my favorites. I don't mean to start an argument over who had the best song. That is a very, it's interesting to compare, but I need to hear the Disney songs and open up your eyes against them to do a real comparison. But I, I actually oh, think okay, it's more ahead. the fact that it's not a villain song. Poor, unfortunate souls, be prepared. Uh, all of the, Let's see, what's another one? Hellfire. All of them are the villains justifying their own actions. Tempest is tr- actually telling Twilight to grow up. In a certain way, maybe there is there is an element of self-justification within it. But I get the sense that she wants Twilight to just shed this naive uh, view that ponies have held for so long and see the world. And it makes her a great contrast against Twilight who herself was starting to doubt uh, friendship. We ha- Gosh, we are talking a lot about Tempest, and we've still got so many characters yeah, to go and through. I, I, there's a few characters we can skip or fast forward a bit. But yes, Tempest here is a hot topic. <laughs> a hot topic. <laughs> Aha, hot topic. <laughs> <laughs> you went there. Just to go back briefly over my point, maybe, yeah, I am overstretching by saying over the past 30 years, but... All of the Disney songs that regard villains, or all, almost all of the villain songs that Disney has had, almost all of them, they are about what the villain wants. They are about power. They are about, oh, I, I have lust for this character, or I want power for myself to become, you know, bigger and have more control over things. Uh, or I want to take over the, the land or whatever. That's, that's usually what 
a villain a villain song is about usually not not always but w- open up your eyes is not about that open up your eyes is about it's like you said silver it's about uh it's it, tempest is standing twilight to grow up to stop being so naive to realize that the world isn't Oh, funny enough, sunshine and rainbows and unicorns, and that there is a lot more darkness out there that she's not seeing, which is where Tempest has been for her entire life. It's a different kind of song. It doesn't even go over Tempest wanting to recover her horn or uh, wanting to to get better again. It's it's not about that. It's a different tone while still being dark. When you say that, is it fair to compare Tempest's song to a villain song because? In all technicality, it's not really a villain song. She petrified three princesses, tried to petrify Twilight, petrifying oh, uh, yeah, Bee on the way. She destroyed a boat. She kidnapped uh, Copper. And she's doing the bidding of what can be described, what is described in the movie as an evil king. She's a villain. The fact that she gets redeemed or she... Uh, she's given a second chance towards the end of the movie, doesn't take away from the fact that she has done oh, really terrible I mean, things. Yeah, that I do agree. I'm not denying that. I'm, all I'm saying here is that um, we've been comparing the song because Tempest's song here is not really, quote-unquote, a villain song. It's more of, a, hey, Pony, Twilight, this is the real world. Wake up. This is how it is. So it's not really a villain song, but more of a... Uh, how do I put this? Where's the word for it, Silver? Do you get an idea? Not a villain song, but something else, an introspection probably, song? Probably. A backstory yeah, probably. song. So, Cadence is a bit off? I'd say that rather than saying that Tempest is the main villain, which I, I think that's Storm King, Tempest is the primary antagonist. And antagonists aren't always villains. I agree with that one. If we if we go into that, I would like to segue into into talking about other characters. Because we do say uh, she's she's an antagonist. She's an antagonist to Twilight. But in this movie, they make it clear that, oh, Twilight and Tempest, they are not so different between each other. Their only difference is their upbringing. But in the end, they are not so different after all. Probably. Uh, I'm, I'm not really 100% sure on that one. The chemistry that I get from the both of them, the sort of relation that I get from them, it's similar to what I got from uh, Spider-Man and the Vulture in Spider-Man Homecoming, where they they are both the underdog. They, I'm talking about Spider-Man and the Vulture now. They're both the underdog. They are they are trying to uh, get in in the respective league, one on the League of the Antagonists and another one on the League of the Superheroes. But in the end, they are not the big guys. They are like the small guys. Tempest and Twilight, they are both powerful in their own regards, but they have different upbringings. All right. You can see that. And they have their lights and shadows. The same way that Twilight can try and steal the pearl when they are with the the sea ponies, the same way uh, Tempest can uh, can stand against the Storm King and petrify him at the end of the film, therefore saving the day. It's it's all about what the character does that may feel out of character, but it's just adding a bit of dimension to what they are. You wouldn't have expected Twilight to steal the pearl. That actually is where the movie gets a lot better. I would agree on that one. And talking about the pearls, let's talk about Queen Novo and Princess Skystar. I fully support a coup d'etat. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and we shall put... <laughs> you're saying that because you're yes. a hippogriff. You shall be the new king, your highness. I have a vested interest. Actually, I think, uh, though she's a little cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs, I think Skystar is already, would already make a better queen than Miss I Need to Go In for a uh, massage or a seaweed wrap. I can understand her reason, though. It's more fueled by paranoia than anything else. Why would she trust someone when the last time she did that, they had to end up changing her entire physiology? Well, at the same time, too, uh, the backstory for the hippogriffs is that the Storm King is coming. Uh, they're powerful warriors, but the Storm King is ruthless. So the smart move is to go underground, or in this case, underwater, and change every griffs into sea ponies. Yay! So that works somehow. And I understand her her hesitation about bringing that that strength up to the surface to be stolen. You know, if the honestly, 
never mind the princesses. If the Storm King got his hands on that pearl, he could have become that figure from the uh, art book. He could have become an actual Storm. That, that's where the, the story of the movie starts changing. Um, that's where the second act uh, is. Uh, 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 that's where, where it, it changes the tone. The moment that Twilight st- uh, tries to steal the pearl. Mm-hmm. Actually, it's funny that you, you mentioned the G1 <laughs> movie, Norman, where the Flutter Ponies ref- refuse to help even though they're the only ones who can stop the smooths. When you have the power to improve the mm-hmm. world and and you're the only one who has access to this, there is a responsibility with that. And you, I think less of characters who don't step up to that. And at the same time, I'm getting sort of burnt out on the plot point of, we go to you for help. Well, we are proud or we are close-minded. We will not help you. You have to prove yourself to us. I understand that can reflect the real world, that can create another challenge for our heroes. But at the same time, you just like, is there never going to be a story where you meet a truly charitable group that's like, you're in trouble? Okay, how okay, can we help? I, before we carry on with this, I need to ask you guys, what was the plan to go to the Hippogriffs to, from the very beginning? I mean, I mean, they was the pearl, but the pearl only changed your physiology. That is not 100% sure. All we know that the pearl changed you into a sea pony and back. That's about it. I want to, I want to, I want to believe that, uh, because this all came from Celestia telling Luna to go after the Queen of the Hippogriffs. She couldn't finish the sentence, go to the Queen of the Hippos, petrified, and Twilight being within earshot to hear that this is happening. Oh, then we have go to the uh, land of the Hippogriffs. Let's go, let's go find them. This could have been a lot different because had Celestia been able to go there and towards the end of the movie this is presented this way, Celestia and Queen Nova seem to be in good terms. It is true what you're saying, Silver, regarding we need to have mo- we, we are getting burned out of oh, you are, are not going to get our help until you prove yourself. It is true. Queen Nova is not a villain though. And it's so weird that they present a character that has her reasons to do the way the, the things she does, but she's not villainous. She's not evil. She's not a she's she's not a bad person. Seahorse, whatever. And she's not inherently bad. And for Hasbro to have finally adapted a queen character that is not Chrysalis into the show slash movie. I don't know, that's kind of refreshing. I, I took her character as kind of I refreshing. I to ask you guys this, because the idea or the reasoning for Celestia to seek help from Queen Novo of the Hippogriffs, like, to me, the idea here was Celestia asking for help from one of her allies to help in the fight for the land, because Equestria is getting, well, pwned in this scenario here. So asking for help from one of the allies makes sense. And who better than to ask help from the mighty proud hippogriffs? Silver, you're up in line. So asking help from them Yay. seems like the natural good idea. But before Celestia finish her line, she says Queen of the Hippos. And by that, Twilight interpreted as, oh, Queen of the Hippos? Question mark. Uh, but with that, it's still asking for help from a mighty powerful ally. And... Knowing that the Hippogriffs too had been attacked by the Storm King and went into hiding, what was the end game here? Because to me, the Pearl didn't do nothing. Well, you it know, changed the Sky Star. It gave us new toys. Yeah, true. I will, I will, I will say, I will say this: the the Pearl is a uh, a red herring. The entire movie, they are presenting you these these hippo these hippogriffs. They are the they are the the hippogriffs are the MacGuffin of the entire film. They are the reason why the plot is moving forward. Uh, they, they the, the and the pearl is the object that they're looking for. It's like oh, okay, so that's the thing, that's the MacGuffin that they're going for. So they're gonna have a musical number and then they are going to be given the pearl and they're going to take the pearl and they're going to take it to their land and let's all have a, let, let, let's have a final fight scene. But that's not what happens. In any other story, the pearl is the MacGuffin. But then Twilight tries to steal the pearl and the story changes. Had Twilight not stolen the pearl, had they been given the pearl, the, the, the rest of the story would have been completely different and the other characters that they had introduced... Uh, Captain Solano, Copper, 
Princess Skystar herself, it would have been pointless for them to appear on the final on the final scene. Because the MacGuffin of the movie is not the pearl. The MacGuffin of the movie is the same MacGuffin from the TV show. That's friendship. Friendship is the so MacGuffin. Basically, I'm the only one in the theaters who's been thinking that the only reason why Twilight is going to the hippogriffs is not to ask for help, quote unquote, as an army, but just for pearl. Because the whole time I'm thinking that hey, they're passing by the Badlands, they could have the changelings, and isn't don't they have a friend with the griffins and the dragons? Because to me, like, hey, we have friends in those areas. Like, Spike is good buddies with Ember, and Ember is the dragon lord. They have power there. If you start doing that, then you fall onto the trap that Silver was talking about before. You have uh, you have too much continuity. You end up neglecting all of the potential new fans that may want to watch your movie. Because if you are like, oh, okay, we're into the... How about we bring all of the Griffons from Griffonstone? Great, let's ask Gilda for help. Who is Gilda? Well, Gilda is this character that blah, 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 five minutes away on exposition. Halfway through, everyone would have been bored. And even even fans of the show would have been, we get it, we know, you don't need to explain. You would have bored the potential new audience to tears, and you would have pissed off the brownies that don't need to be told this. In all honesty, okay, maybe the Griffins not, maybe the change today, no, but the dragons, in the, at the same time, come on, you have Spike. Yeah, oh my god, the change today <laughs> is another can of worms that yeah, you don't yeah. want to open, because, okay, oh. it's like... Yeah, no, no, yeah. no, no. Well, I, I, I want to interject mm-hmm. real quick. I agree that mostly they, they didn't bring these folks up because... That would be too much mm-hmm. for a new audience, too much of an info dump exposition. It's a tough call. But I think that there's a counter argument for every possible ally. The Griffins are disorganized and unruly. <laughs> right now they've got a grand total of two Griffins supporting Equestria, G- Gilda and Gabby. That's about it. The Changelings are, they would be an interesting fight, but then th- we saw that the Storm King has built up an anti-magic arsenal. And the changelings on their own don't have a lot of physical strength. If their magic is nullified, they're just bugs <laughs> that are not much stronger right. than ponies. Numbers have been, always been the changelings' greatest strength, and they don't have that now. Dragons. Ember's on your side. But imagine for a moment, you've just invited a horde of dragons to Canterlot, <laughs> filled with riches and treasures and gems. <laughs> okay, okay. They will Can... eat. The, they will eat half of the towers before they decide to attack. <laughs> or they might decide, you know, we save this, so this is ours now. Yeah. And even Ember might not be able to dissuade them. Mm-hmm. At least not right away. She she's still new in her uh, role. Part of this is me also just trying to connect the dots in my own head. So I can't say uh, I can't say this is what the writers were thinking. I can't say this is the logical conclusion. But I think there is an argument against every ally because Equestria needed big, strong, numerous allies because for inexplicable <laughs> reasons, the Royal Guards took a day off. No, 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 no. <laughs> no, no. The, the real reason why the Royal Guards are not there is because of the new baby in the Crystal Empire. They need the whole Blessed Army to keep track of have one baby. Have you seen her? Well, have you seen what... Have you seen what... <laughs> what Florian can do? Um, no, but... I am with Silver when 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 you when you made your react video, which by the way I watched before we got into this into this recording. Um, I have I must have rewatched that like five times or something like that. It's one of the funniest things you've ever produced. Oh, and it's, it is true. Uh, Shining Armor is going to be sleeping on the couch for the rest of his life. Where are you, Shiny? Your wife just turned to stone. You lost three princesses and your sister is on the run. Where are you? I'm taking care of the baby. <laughs> No, but okay, uh, Silver, nice explanation there. I I agree. <laughs> okay, with that, I do agree. But here's my counter-argument for the dragons. They're dragons. It would be cool. Like, do you not want to see those dragons in the big screen? <laughs> well, no, well, now you're just tempting me, sir. You know about my dragon fixation. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but, yeah, that that's why even in the React video I said, what, just give Twilight the Pearl. Even if they have to go, just turn them uh, into dragons. Well, probably a blue eyes white dragon. <laughs> Aren't straight. Or what about a blue eyes pink dragon? <laughs> I'm going to bring you all. Wee! <laughs> yeah. We saw from Rescue Midnight Castle what cool dragons ponies can turn <laughs> into. 
I mean, come on. Oh, yeah. Uh, oh, God, that was not. I can't remember that. Here's one of my biggest gripes about the movie. The Storm King's army conquers Canterlot almost unopposed. The ponies have no resistance. Even these powerful princesses are, are – their first reaction is to run away. I'm like – and again, okay, maybe my great critique is that once again we're relying on the princesses being rendered impotent to uh, to really accomplish mm-hmm. anything. But then a party of t- like 13, 14 heroes, the remain five, the pirates and Capper and Spike and Skystar. They thwart the entire Storm King army. So if we go by sort of a sliding power scale, either surprise is the ultimate bonus or the ponies come off as exceptionally weak when all you needed was double the number of your main characters to win this. I think they had a strong constitution to plot convenience and they rolled a 20. But there, there is a, a... an art book rendition of the Hippogriff army flying with the pirates and everyone to go rescue Twilight and mm-hmm. Equestria. I would have loved to see the Hippogriff army versus the Storm Same King army. Here. Our main heroines can still be the ones to save the princesses, defeat the Storm King, and get the uh, get the mm-hmm. staff. But the Hippogriffs can open the path for them. I will be your shield. If you talk about strength in numbers and all that, you are right, but th- there is both the surprise factor... And, and and the fact that halfway through that fight, the Storm King just makes a tornado out of nowhere, which blows away a good part of his army. So he's just been mad with power, megalomaniac, take it what you want. Either that or maybe there, there wasn't that many, that many forces. When you start to bring the logic of, oh, strength in numbers and all that, yeah, of course it's going to fall apart. It's, it's more, I think they were going for something more poignant than that. I I am a fan of the heroes having not a big army but a small army, you know, kind of like they're like the Dirty Dozen at that point. They have the pirates, Skystar, Copper, and the the rest of the main five and Spike, or the main six and Spike. It's not exactly the 300 Spartans. They are more like a mini army. They're almost like a platoon. Ponies. Prepare for friends. But, but here's the thing too, what Silver <laughs> mentioned with the ar- the Hippogriff army and whatnot. And here's the thing. For me, when I see the whole thing where uh, Skystar came out and she's willing to help, why didn't she bring along a few uh, soldiers or whatnot? Because they were selling the Hippogriff toys too, like the, uh, the soldier toys. Like they were selling that. She's bringing Shelly, Shelly and Sheldon. Do you think that's I, not I, enough? I mean, how dare you, sir? How dare you? Here's, here's the thing. That means the power of she shells. <laughs> the, the Storm King has, uh, uh, yeah, probably, because the Storm King has an army. What do you have? We have Shelly and Sheldon. Hey, they were very useful. <laughs> they were eating the, the eyes out of that Storm King guard. <laughs> and uh, as a side note, we've totally been uh, not mentioning or not talking about Princess Skystar. And Skylar or Skystar? Skystar, right? All right, Princess Sky Star. Star, she's there. She helped. That's about it. Oh, but she's really, really lonely, and she really needs a friend. So I ship Pinkie Pie and her. As to why she wouldn't bring any guards or soldiers with her, this is Princess Talks the Clan. <laughs> so they might not be. They might not be willing to uh, put their lives in her hands. Uh, so be, they're not crusaders then. <laughs> All righty then. Now you want masks. <laughs> Mass Crusaders, <laughs> watching over time, <laughs> fighting crap, fighting crap. Okay, so we, we've done. Yes, I'm going full 80s on y'all. You're going, you're going total 80s. Can we talk about the 80s tone of the movie? Uh, how it was missing during the first two acts of it? If you think about it from, from a writing point of view, the movie completely changed, changes gears towards the third act. It's like the, the first two acts of the movie are like a movie on itself. And then the third act, it's a movie on its own. It's very, it's very bright and colorful, but then Twilight tries to steal the pearl and the movie changes completely. I brought this up earlier. I was thinking yeah. we may, we maybe could talk about that for just, uh, for just a couple so of minutes. So basically the change of tones. Yeah, I, I, I can see that. And, whew, I do like it. Like the, the moment, I, I think that's the third story act line, was it? Yeah, it's the third, the third, third uh, the third yeah, act of the story. That changed. Yeah. Like that was a well, very entertaining. 
And then this has probably been the most divisive thing about the movie. Some people are saying Twilight was completely out of character trying to steal mm-hmm. the pearl. And other, others are, are debating it. Oh, Twilight is worst princess. Twilight is worst character ever. No, she's the greatest. You, you stink. No, you stink. Your mom, your mom. <laughs> uh, have you been hanging out on Xbox Silver? Oh, the online community can be cruel. Very cruel. For everything. For everything. But here's my view on Twilight taking the pearl, which did, did change the tone. And suddenly Twilight is not being a, the best friend. Throughout this thing, Okay, how do I say this? Ponies represent an ideal. Equestria is very idealized in that everyone gets along. There's a great balance. There are some logistical hiccups and maybe some uh, species biased. But by and large, I view it as a very positive place. But ideas only have meaning if they're challenged. And Twilight has witnessed putting trust in other people outside of Equestria has nearly led to them being enslaved or turned over to the Storm King. There's been ample opportunities where she was afraid they were going to be betrayed and she's having some trust issues. Plus, in sort of the opposite of their journey to the Castle of Two Sisters in the series premiere, even though Twilight's friends have helped, they've also hindered making a lot of big and often foolish mistakes. I agree. So Twilight's confidence is pretty well shaken and she's put a lot of pressure on herself investing her ego in her identity as the princess. I have to be the one to fix this because I am the princess. Uh, you mentioned that, Silver, and this reminds me of the season three premiere where Twilight had put an, mm. a lot of stress on herself to save the Crystal Empire. I have to save the Crystal Empire. I have to save the Crystal Empire. And she had to let it go to let Spike be the one to save it. This reminds me of that. You say season three premiere, the one that I was thinking of, I... <clears throat> this the, the the whole ending of the movie, the the third act, it's like a combination of the season two finale, the the, the wedding, and the season <clears throat> sorry about that, the season four finale with Tirek. Uh, but it does both a lot better. Like you remember how in in the wedding episodes, uh, Twilight gets abandoned by all of her friends, Princess Celestia, her brother, and Spike. Because of because she was accusing uh, Cadence, uh, not Cadence, uh, of not being herself, of being evil. So in this movie, after she steals the pearl and she calls out Pinkie Pie of all the ponies uh, for what she's for what they have been doing, uh, she gets abandoned by the main the, the other the other main six, except for Spike. Spike stays behind, stays with her. And doesn't abandon her. That is that is good. That's that's a good moment because why would Spike abandon Twilight, perhaps the most important person in her li- in his life? And then after Twilight gets kidnapped, we have the open up your eyes song and all that. We cut back to the main five, the the remain five, and and Applejack is like, maybe we should go back and talk to Twilight. As in, they are also showing remorse, and they are realizing that maybe abandoning her friend, their friend, wasn't the best of the ideas. It's it's a it's a better uh, it's a better tackling of that situation than they did in the wedding. It's so much better. It's so much more in character, and it's much much more sympathetic. They are doing it differently. In honesty, James, uh, I don't think that the friends were abandoning her when. They, when they found out that she was trying to steal the pearl, I think they were most di- mostly disappointed in her. They were this close. They were this close from they were abandoning not. her, they... and then she screams to Pinkie. Yeah, they were, and then she screams to Pinkie Pie, and that's where they have they, the they falling were disappointed out. But in like her. every friendship, <clears throat> in the in the words of D W K, friends are not people that you don't argue with. Friends are people that you get you can get mad or with, and then it's worth forgiving over yeah, and but over the thing again. Is they were disappointed. That, that's that's. I'm not saying. A, uh, yeah, they, they yes. were dis- no, they were disappointed, but they were disappointed, but it wasn't as bad as it was on the season two f- finale. Which I will keep. I will keep going. I will keep. I will keep going over it. I don't like that finale. I thought. It I'm sucked. not going to talk about the series. I'm talking about mostly for the movie now. And you mentioning that. I'm talking I'm about just, both, saying, and, and how this third act is a combination. No, 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 I'm of just both. saying that you're you're saying that they abandoned Twilight uh, because she tried to steal the pearl and whatnot. To me, that was not. Yeah, yeah they left her to behind. Me, no, they they were 
giving her time to think and we we're, we're going to have space for ourselves because we're very disappointed in you waggle finger and silver we're very disappointed <laughs> and silver you were trying to say something Silver, silver, or silver, Sil- James. I'm silver. Sorry, I lose track myself. Yeah, I don't know who I am anymore, Norman. Who am I? We've created an identity crisis. I uh, think he's giving me a bit of his dimension now. I don't know who I am anymore. Huh? <laughs> but uh, I, I think everybody just needed space. They, you've had a big argument. You've had a big disappointment. <clears throat> the ponies have seen Twilight sort of at the end of her rope. I think it makes sense that they all just sort of needed a timeout from one another. And Spike, loyal Spike, who in a Cantalot wedding just disappeared. They didn't even show him walking out. They're just, he just like, Spike, who's Spike? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he just, he's banished. I had he's to gone. buy a plush of he's him gone. just to so, remind me who he is. Oh, yes, actually, I should add him to my plush collection. Hmm. But I think that scene worked because everyone needed their space. But it, I agree with James that it's better than a Cantalot wedding because they didn't just go on without her. They needed a break, and the minute they realized she was in trouble, rallied to her instantly. And again, I, I wish that could have happened with a hippogriff army at their back, but now I'm just mm-hmm. repeating myself. So, yeah. No, I now do. Now I'm just repeating myself. Yeah. Now I'm I, just repeating I, myself. Does oh, this no. bug you? Does this bug you? Does this bug you? Does this bug you? He's got in a cycle, everybody. Oh, no. We need help. We need an intervention. We need an intervention. Watch out, Silver. There comes Mary Sue. I'm going what? to beat you up, you pigeon. Oh, God. Not the brooms. Anything uh, with the brooms. But, um, uh, I, I do I, I do agree with you when, when it comes to the, the hippogriff army and all that. It's it's the problem when you look at concept art. And you look at concept art and you are like, Oh my god, this is so cool. This could have been awesome and then you go to the director, you go to the Jason Thiessen and he's like, I'm not going to see this finished. I will die before this is completed. <laughs> you know that, right? Because you, usually when you are making a movie, you have to start getting at the getting at the scissors and cut, 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 cut. Because either you are running out of budget or you are running out of time, or you have the you have the production company breathing down your neck and telling you to get the product ready so they can get it in time to uh, promote the toys for Christmas. Uh, it's a lot of problems and some things they have to go. And yeah, it is a disappointment that we didn't have the hippogriff army in there. I mean. Yeah. I'm, I'm not. I'm not trying to sound. I think I'm coming across as a complete and total. That's ass. not a word. But I'm. 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 I'm not sure if you were having this into a consideration when you were mentioning uh, the uh, the disappointment for not having the hippogriff army. Well, it, there is the concept art. I, one, I recommend everybody take a look at the the art of the MLP movie book because even if it didn't make it into the the movie, I appreciate how the artists and creators just threw things out there and saw what worked, what stuck, what didn't. I love seeing the ideas, the creative process. It's okay if it doesn't make it in. I still enjoyed the fight. I still, my mouth dropped when Capper used Spike to light uh, enemies on fire. It's like, yeah. over, here, over here is gentle Fluttershy coaxing one through emotional issues and giving him uh, sort of a mm-hmm. therapy session, and yeah. he's like burning them all. <laughs> I have to say that Fluttershy's fight scene was the best. Well, that's just it. That was Fluttershy's only scene. It was really cool, though, to see Copper and Spike working together. Because the first time that Spike looks at Copper, and I was, uh, I was like, I was prepared to, oh boy, here we go. They're gonna have a fight, or they're gonna have a hissy fit, or a or an argument, or whatever. No. They actually end up getting along really nicely, and they work together as a team. That's so nice. That's not. That's they didn't play that trope. They they uh they reversed it. Yeah, which that, that is a positive there. And the whole well, Kepper Kepper and the pirates. Uh, we're already one hour and sixteen in. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> have we been talking about the movie for that long? Oh, there's there, there's a lot to talk about, but we are oh. now almost as long as the movie yeah. itself. So, anyway, um, should, should we talk about Kepper and the uh, pirates all in one? Because I think, like we mentioned before, I, yeah. Okay, let's go for Kepper first. I like this characteristic here. Um, he's yeah, really not... cool, and his backstory in the comic does explain a lot about his character here. Uh, I do like the uh, face turn; it's awesome. Uh, James, what about you? I'm not going to go for a long time talking about Capper. I'm just going to say this. I wasn't expecting to like Capper, and he is the character that I like the most of the movie. Uh, he is like Drax <laughs> the, Destro- the Destroyer for uh, Guardians of the Galaxy. In my opinion, 
in the way that I perceived it. I didn't think I was going to like Drax in Guardians of the Galaxy. Drax is great. I didn't think I was going to like Copper. Copper is great. <laughs> right, is. Silver. There you go. He's great. Well, Capper, I definitely gave him the award for fast heel to face turn. One kind act from Rarity wins him over, which, uh, yeah, the, the Spike Capper rivalry yeah. could have been a thing, but I'm glad they didn't, they didn't focus on that. Yeah. It, it, because he, ha- he doesn't have a lot of screen time, he does his part well, but you just don't get enough time to really get to know him as a character. One funny thing is that people complain the comic conflicted with his bio on the movie website. The, the website said, he was former Abyssinian royalty, yeah. Abyssinian, uh, nobility, and that's not what the comics said. Honestly, I just go with the comics. The bios were so yeah. short. And I didn't read the bio from the website, so I got no idea about that one. And putting that aside, uh, reading the comics, he was never into the whole stealing and conning people. He was always trying to get out of it. And his whole heel to face turn was kind of there I, I totally agree with it although he also gave Applejack the best, one of the best lines well look what the cat dragged in himself himself that was already uh-huh. that was right dang it <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm desperate for Applejack to have a good, good moment in this movie uh, too oh I'm sorry but she's not marketable enough nobody cares about the, the dirty uh, mud right. ponies Oh. <laughs> oh no no there's a scene there's a scene but uh, it involves the pirates and let's talk about the pirates the, the pirates were interesting they were yeah, they, they were, were fun, fun. Yeah. we had as our dear muffin mare was petrified <laughs> first you tempest uh we had the cross-eyed parrot banging <laughs> heads on the drums to be our wacky <laughs> visual and i have to say this like the the whole way they, they work was interesting because oh uh lunchtime break so they invite everyone or every pony into the uh, mess hall and had dinner or lunch, whatever it is. And from there, like, what? Everybody was like, what? <laughs> it's 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 a, it's good comedic timing what they have right there. Uh, it's it's a bit of a shame they uh, we 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 barely mention voice actors. Uh, Why is I will just I will just say they. Kind of gave Zoe Saldana the short end of the deal, though, because they don't make um, as much use of her as they did of Tay Dix or as they did of of Emily Blunt. It's which is kind of bizarre because you you would expect Zoe Saldana. She is super well known. She has been in Star Trek and she has been in in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. She she's been in big movies. She was even the first big role she had, oddly enough, was in the Pirates of the Caribbean movie, as you guessed it. A pirate. So it would have been a cool idea to to hey, you can connect these two. There's no there's no reason why you shouldn't. And what we see of Captain Salano is so little. Like we see as much of her as we see of uh, we see more of Capper, we see more of Tempest, and we see more of Grubber. We see very little it's, of Salano. It's yeah, a bit I, of a it's shame. very unfortunate. Like I would love to see more of Captain Salano. And by the way, uh, that scene with Applejack, it's when they were in the mess hall and everybody was eating except for the ponies, but Applejack, she was just eating it in. Like, okay, I have food. I'm happy. But oh, what does that to... say? My, my second favorite pony's top scene is eating food. It's one of the <laughs> scenes. <laughs> I felt. I thought her best scene was at the beginning of the film where she's, where <laughs> Rarity is like, were you raised in a barn? No offense, Applejack. None taken. I wasn't raised in a barn. My family just happened to own a barn where I was born and spent most of my formative years. <laughs> Which is one of the one of the funniest scenes in the movie. And it's right at the beginning. I thought that was her, the highlight and Apple for her. Ta- sorry, and Apple, <laughs> and Apple Rainbow Dash just swoops in and says, we were raised in a barn. <laughs> raised in a barn. Uh. So, uh, those, uh, quote unquote, the new characters. Uh, the main six, Pinkie Pie was annoying most of the time. The, the main oh. six, people were saying, oh, they are season one main six. Kind, kind of. of. Not really. I don't really see it. I don't really see it. In this sort of movie, the most extreme personalities tend to stand out. And so, after Twilight, the main focus, you have the most extreme personality, Pinky, who's wigging out and flipping out throughout the whole movie, drama queen rarity, and both boisterous Rainbow Dash. Yeah. Fluttershy and Applejack are both uh, the most quiet and the most even-keeled, respectively. 
so they are in this sort of setting. They're going to get drowned out pretty easily. No, it's no kidding. People were saying, "Oh, it's the My Little Pony movie starring Twilight Sparkle, Pinkie Pie, and Rainbow Dash with guest appearances by Rarity and Applejack and a cameo by Fluttershy." <laughs> and here's the thing: um, I have a friend who is a fan of the show, but also a movie reviewer. And she got to watch the movie early, and she had to write a review for it. And she said that this movie here, the main, the most outstanding characters are the one that you mentioned, and Applejack and Fluttershy were kind of superfluous. They were kind of there, but not really. So it was kind of sad to see that because we all know that Fluttershy and Applejack can do a lot of good things if given the chance. But you can't spell superfluous without super, <laughs> Yes, <right>? indeed. <laughs> uh, so, let's see. We, we tackled the main six plus Spike. We tackled the newer characters. Ah, the most of the budget that went to was the song. I have to give full credit here to the actors that sang their own song. That was just too good and too amazing. Yeah, the, the open up your eyes in particular. The Daniel Ingram said he wrote the song with uh, with Emily Blunt in mind, and in his own words, he said that all previous movies that had her singing, they didn't uh, use her singing skills uh, to their full potential. He said, "Open up your eyes" was meant to uh, get best use out of Vocals? her uh, yeah. her vocal abilities. Yeah. It, yes, and I agree. Is, I don't have the. Uh movie knowledge that you do, James. But I think that it really did take full advantage of her voice, and that's why it stood out to me. It's yeah, one of my it, faves. It's uh, the, Emily, Emily Bloom did have, uh, has had singing roles. The most recent one was Into mm-hmm. the Woods, uh, where, where she managed to stand out against, uh, against none other than Meryl Streep. And she was okay, but she only had two songs in it. And she wasn't even the focus of those. She was just a a vocal accompaniment. She was one of the many characters that were involved in the movie. Supporting Mm. role. Uh, No kidding, they got the full potential out of her in in this one. They they, they did really... really My favorite song for the movie was uh, awesome. What what was... Yeah, Time to be awesome. awesome. Time to be awesome. Like hearing Zoe Zeldana sing her roles was, oh my God, that was just so good. And the harmony that they did between Ashley Ball and her was just so good. For me personally, that's my favorite song for the movie. But yeah. It's the one that has all the staples to <laughs> to be nominated for an Oscar. What, that one? I mean, it's um, listening to that and I am like, you know what, if it had a bit... I don't think... Maybe we should talk about that to end the, the, the review on. The, the whole... Oh, now people are getting mad because it's award season. And the movie has not been what? pre-selected to be nominated for a Best Animated Feature in the Oscars. And it's probably not going to be nominated for anything. And people are like, eh, the money movie is not getting nominations for nothing. Oh my god. Really? First, first you complain that the movie is not making enough money and you're complaining now that it's not getting nominations for awards. Are you kidding me, guys? Oh, I mean, not get, not getting enough views, okay, that I can, but no, move, no. Cartoon movies don't get nominated unless they're big shots like Pixar or Disney. This one? Nah, man. <laughs> yeah, the awards, the awards have a, a reputation for a very elitist attitude. So I don't look to the awards for justification. I like mm. what I like. They they are so elitist. They went to give an Oscar to Suicide Squad. Very elite. <laughs> Very elite. <laughs> well, for costumes. No, for for makeup, which is even worse. Makeup and clothing, I think, was the the category. And no, like, okay. no, it was it was ma- makeup and hairstyle. And costumes was given to Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them. Oh, I I, no, I forget to mention one other character because we've been not talking about her. She's kind of the whole attraction, the main attraction, if you say. Oh God! <laughs> uh, see, okay, I'm not a huge oh, God. Cena fan. <laughs> oh God! Yes, I, I, I don't know her. I'm, I'm old. I'm out of touch with your youngins with your iPads and your iPhones and your eyeballs. Silver, you are not alone. I am I am on that group as well. Uh, you go, but I also have to say a couple of things about Sia. Okay, one, character design. That scene where Twilight is being carted through the Concord Canterlot, 
and she has this long, mournful stare with Sia or Songbird Serenade. That really works better if you have eyeballs. I mean, right now it's it's like she could be asleep under that mane, for all I know. And Twilight's looking at her mournfully. He's like, I'm not even paying attention. Shaw. The only other thing is, I mean nothing against Sia as a performer, but I felt like her song didn't match the ending celebration. It seemed more mm-hmm. somber, and it was something that should have played more in the middle. Mm-hmm. I know she was singing it a cappella without when uh, Canterlot was conquered, but afterward, it just didn't work for me. You nailed that one right on the head. It's too somber. It's too dark. And maybe it's just me, but I don't, I, I, I am not really fond of her voice. She sounds a little bit too like, like she's shivering in the middle of a storm. She sounds too shaky and I am going to sing you this song. And I'm like, is she going to turn into Christopher Walken at one point during this? <laughs> I'm not going to lie, it was a bit jarring, I don't know. I try not to say no disrespect, but I'm completely throwing her under a bus. But I I didn't, I, I, I wasn't too fond of her vocals. I wasn't too like... But, okay, he's, he's still okay. okay. I, I highly agree. That, you did it again, Norman! It's James! <laughs> <laughs> I have an identity <laughs> crisis by the end of okay, this okay. recording. Uh, okay, uh, guys, guys, I agree with what you guys have to say. I, I totally agree. And... I'm in the boat where she did nothing. She only said the beginning line. She sang her a cappella. She sang the end song. And in all honesty, they spent thousands upon thousands just to get her in. And in all honesty, it's worth the money. Because I had non-brony friends asking me, is Sia going to be in the movie? And I say, yes, she is. She is going to be in the movie. You should go watch it. Go spend the money to watch Sia in the Pony movie. Go. <laughs> in all honesty, I was being dishonest, but at the same time, too, I was not lying. <laughs> yeah, you were using your friends, Don. <laughs> you lied to hey, your hey, friends. Hey, Shun him. They, they, they yeah, asked, sir, you. What a they asked you are. if Sia is going to be in the movie. And I say yes. Was she in the movie? Yes, I was not lying. <laughs> Technically, she wasn't. <laughs> Songbird Serenade was in the you movie. Know what I mean. She had seen his You know what I mean, but yes, she was in the movie. She was, you, you know, it was, it was, uh, Sia the Horse, the same way that, uh, Tempest was Emily Blunt <laughs> yeah, Horse. Yeah. It, it was, it wasn't even, it wasn't even, uh, a lampshaded. <laughs> <laughs> it, it was yeah. them. They, they they went and just portrayed them yeah. as horses. Hey, we, we, there's nothing wrong. You portray the character much more clearly, but still. Oh no, I'm not saying that's a, I'm not saying that's a bad thing. It, you you have to be, it, you cannot be disingenuous, disingenuous, and that's exactly what this uh, what the movie was. The movie wasn't trying to lure you into a sense of oh no, we're not trying to do this. No, this is a completely this is a completely different character from the actor that's portraying them. Yeah. No, it is. But <laughs> hell, even even Gruber looks a little bit like Michael Peña. Uh, but still, um, we, we we've mentioned characters, we mentioned songs, we mentioned Sia. So what else do we need to mention? Because uh, we've been almost an hour and a half here. We are all over the place. Oh well, there's still the matter of the princesses and how. I will say, even when she's getting captured, Luna, my favorite princess, because she actually hit some of the bad guys mm-hmm. on her way out. Just like when getting kidnapped by Changeling, she's the one who gets word to uh, Starlight. But I'm... How to describe this? This was in development while the show was still going on. So in some ways, this is reflecting earlier ideas of the show. But i am worn out on the princesses getting <laughs> rendered obsolete. Uh-huh. They've, they've been captured, depowered, decommissioned. It's becoming almost... It's gone past comedy into tragedy. <laughs> no, the, Silver, the thing is that Hasbro wants to promote as many products as they have. They have the ponies, they have the Transformers sound, there is that reference to Hungry Hungry Hippos, and they also like to pro- to promote Nerf, which is what they do every time to the businesses. <laughs> they keep oh, nerfing them. Oh, God. <laughs> oh, great. Maybe I should just come up with a new guy get, get hit by the oh, Nerf gun. God. Yeah. <laughs> Little foam ball bounces but, off them. 
That's that's the power inside those green orbs. They are full of nerf darts. Or gak. Gak. Or gak. Oh, yeah, it is gak. Uh, but still. I mean, especially when Celestia's like, oh, an invading army. Quick, Luna, go get someone else to do our battle for us. Just like, what? What? You are the princess of the sun. Burn them. No, she doesn't want to abuse her power. And also, she's an old lady. No. Oh. Oh. Okay. Norman, Wait, you, right you, the, the, the Celestia fans will be out in droves. Hey, hey Josh. I'm, I'm not saying that Celestia's old. I'm saying the princesses are old. Celestia and Luna are over a thousand years old. They need the rest. Oh, oh. And Cadence, <laughs> Cadence, she, she yeah. tried. It's adorable that she tried. She's the only one that did yeah. something. She did the shield spell, so that's to count something, right? She's not her husband, but still. Luna took to the flight, got through part of their line, zapped a few on the way, and then got hit. And then nearly got shattered. Mm, that would have been yeah. a, a bad... Yeah, you know what? Well. I think that that was poor planning on them. Had Twilight not been a, not been there to catch her in yeah. the middle of the air, do you think they would have been able to get the nope. power out of her? Maybe they would nope. have. Maybe, uh. maybe, 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 maybe they would have. I mean, according to the title credits, the Storm King is still alive. Really? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. In a pile of rubble. Uh, Don't you yeah, see yeah, the yeah, eyes yeah. moving on the st- the Storm yeah, King's yeah. statue when he's been in the cre- when he appears yeah, in the I title did, credits? I, I don't remember. <laughs> he's still alive. <laughs> Well, th- this shows ponies are more hardcore. They're kind of like the Ewoks, all cute and fluffy, but then you realize they're they're drumming on the decapitated de- 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 of their okay. enemies. A- a- a Star Wars Ewoks or Family Guy parody Ewoks? Because they are both really hardcore, both of them. <laughs> Actually, there is just one last scene I'd like to talk about. Oh. And th- this is hotly debated. After Twilight has caught Luna and you see a green orb flying towards her, you hear a voice cry mm-hmm. out, Twilight. A rainbow flashes by Twilight, and it is Derpy who is mm-hmm. petrified. Now, this led to some debate over who saved Twilight. Did Derpy push her out of the way? Did Rainbow pull Twilight aside and Derpy was just a casualty? Um, to me, when my interpretation of that scene is either this. Derpy was running away from the chaos, and she got in the way. And the thing was probably split second. And here's the thing. The... Stone ball, whatever it was, uh, it doesn't really affect one person or one pony. It affects anything that is in its general area, AOE, because it was shown at the end, remember, with the Tempest and Storm King? So if Derpy got hit, it would have hit Twilight too. So Derpy hit first, Rainbow Dash saves Twilight, and that. <laughs> Derpy shot first. <laughs> So, Derpy shot first. I am with Silver, though. I'm pretty sure that was Derpy getting on the way. I said that. That's what I said. Yeah, yeah. I, I am, I am, I am, I am with the both of you. And that was her screaming, uh, screaming uh, Twilight's name. Out. But Silver, yeah. you said a lot of theories happened. What did you hear? Yeah. What was what's so hotly debated about this? I don't understand that part. Well, the big debate is who saved Twilight. Was it Derpy or Rainbow? And as such, was Derpy's sacrifice even mean anything if it was Rainbow? When I first saw it, I assumed it was Rainbow Dash who not only pulled Twilight away, but pushed Derpy into the path to throw them off, which I thought, Rainbow, party foul. Uh, you know, kind of a dark, uh, dark interpretation, but that's what the chain of events implied mm-hmm. to me. The second time I saw it, I watched and it, I did see Derpy running. So this is where I'll disagree with you, Norman. I don't think she was running away from chaos. She was running towards a cluster of six guards or storm soldiers, storm <laughs> troopers, jumping towards Twilight. So I do believe she was running in with the intent to help really Twilight. Now. With the rainbow flash, I have to assume that rainbow dash grabbed Twilight and got her out of the way. So two were trying to help her and it looks like Derpy got in the crossfire. But when I watch it again, I want to have a stopwatch. And I want to time just how long it is before Tempest and Grubber realize they got the wrong pony. Even though Derpy may not have saved Twilight directly, she bought them so much time to get a head start, which may have actually extended, prevented their capture. So I'm not going to say that Derpy's contribution was meaningless. Mm. 
I think she bought them much needed time to get right. away. That, that is a good point. That is a good point. Now that you mention it, like I need to re watch the scene again, but the scene is kind of fresh in my mind where I kind of remember Derpy's eyes. She was in a panic. She didn't have that determination in her eyes. So to me, she was kind of bumbling in front of the ball by accident. Well, I think when you see everyone being attacked, I, I wouldn't uh, blame her for having a panic look, even as she uh, goes around. Although, look at it, Princess Twilight fills you with oh, determination. Yay! Ah, oh, great. Another fandom that is going to join this. Uh, we get, we just keep getting more and more. So, anywho, um, is there anything else you want to talk about? Because if not, I think we can wrap it up. I think it's a good time to wrap it up. We've, we've been at this for as long as the movie oh, itself yeah. has aired. We, yeah, we have been, we have been going for way longer than that. Oh my god, and it's kind of like we did it very unstructured, though I think that kind of yeah, works. It always works for us. Oh yeah. <clears throat> it's fun. Yeah. Having this sort of discussion, and I'm not going to lie, guys, I have had this, these thoughts rolling around in my head for the past two weeks or something like that. You have no idea how happy I am to finally let in, letting them out. I, I just hope I didn't, I, I didn't cut anyone off or I, I didn't came off as rude or as... That's not a word! Or anything like that. I don't want to, like, I don't want to, I don't want to upset anybody. You did usurp my name many times, I mean. I what? guess I should, I should start introducing myself as James Cork now. No! Silver, you don't want to do that. People will request very weird... That's not a word! ...from you. All, all, all I have Hi. to say is that Sweetie Boy is going to have a great old time. <laughs> you, you, will, you will have to restructure your channel completely and turn it into Silver Queen After Dark. Don't do that. Uh, <clears throat> oh, my, my, my. Oh yeah, uh, but, but anywho, but anywho, oh, yeah. um, if you guys yeah. at home <laughs> have, well, if you guys at home would like to share your opinion or have your say in the matter, um, the comments are down below. I know I'll read them. I'm not 100% sure about you guys, but still, I'll read them and I'll reply to them because, hey, there's a lot of things that we probably miss. I'm I'm sure of it because... Like Silver mentioned with Derpy, I didn't know about that one. And you guys at home probably will say something about the hippogriffs that I didn't notice. Oh, one thing I have to point out. We saw Twilight's best friends on a bridge. So that's cool. Was Moon Dancer yes, there? Yes, I got to rewatch was she Moon was there. Dancer. She was. She so, was. But anywho, um, Good. But anywho, if you guys at home would like to support the show, you can do so at patreon.com and coffee.com. With every support, you'll get early access to the review and discussion podcast, exclusive and deleted content and a huge thank you from me talking about thank yous I'd like to thank Lurka, Cat, Namjagatoria, Starstream Master of Lag, Amy and also Mark thank you so much guys for the awesome support and like I mentioned before if you guys would like to share your opinion the comments are down below I'll read them and give you a thumbs up yay so anywho um, next week we'll probably do something I'm not 100% sure but hey uh, this has been a lot of fun the movie has been a blast. And James, thank you for coming on, man. Like, it's been so long. Yeah, it's been like, what, two years? It's been fun to do this again. Uh, it's good to have you back. Oh, yeah, thank you. Well, I, I, I'll, I'll see if I can do this more often, actually. Wouldn't, wouldn't mind going back to reviewing episodes with you guys if you, if, you have a, if you have an opening spot. I regret that Sapphire couldn't be here to talk with you. She's feeling under the weather. Oh, that, yeah, I was, I was very, I was very sad to know that she wouldn't be able to join. I was really looking forward to talking with her as well. Uh, getting sick and whatnot is, is unavoidable. Like, can't do anything. Really. Yeah, it sucks. But uh, yeah, I, 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 I think we are all sick while recording this. I'm yeah. surprised that we haven't coughed as much as we could have. Uh, we could have. Uh, you know, I saw mutes from somebody. <laughs> I, I was muting myself all the time. I was coughing like a beat up dog. Believe me, I'm I, I'm not very well. As as uh, was I. I was coughing uh, away from the microphone. But anywho, I have been Norman Sanzo. Stupid, stupid concrete. <laughs> I'm James Ford. <laughs> and, and and I have been Mr. Plinker. Thank you, everybody. Bye. <laughs> I will like, see you next week for another fun episode of your show. See ya. <laughs> Adios. Send me an email if you want a pizza roll. <laughs> <laughs>
silver now, and James is <laughs> sapphire. <laughs> Uh, no, I am silver. I definitely am silver. You call me silver like five or six times. I, I've become I've become poor, poor Norman's uh, bane over these podcasts. He's trying to make a point, and here I am make, trying to make him giggle. <laughs> <laughs> what?